you remember in uh, various places, especially when Venerable Moggalla attained enlightenment, he, oh, sorry, Venerable Kondanya attained enlightenment, he simply said, Yang Kinchi Samudaya Dhammang, Sabbang Taniro Dhammang. Yang Kinchi means that whatever. And when, uh, in many places, uh, when somebody attains enlightenment, he said, Yang Kinchi. Samudaya Dhammang, Sabbantang, Nirodha Dhammang. Whatever is of the nature of arising is of the nature of passing away. And therefore the word Yang King, Yang means uh, whatever. Anyway, for convenience sake, uh, we have translated as wherever, where they are. Loki, the world, where there is anything agreeable and pleasurable in the world. Here the world is, uh, as I mentioned this morning, uh, this 18, uh, combination of 18 elements is the world. Senses, six senses are, uh, six elements, Six sensory objects are objective elements and consciousness arising in them are consciousness elements. Now there is a combination of all these things for the, to make the world. So the combination is the, if you remember, first uh, part, then it is just a repetition. So let us go through one by one. I, the I is agreeable and pleasurable in the world. Our eyes and they are visual objects later on. Our eyes are pleasurable and agreeable. They are uh, craving arises and establishes itself. Eyes are pleasurable, not painful, right? <laughs> So pleasure is right there in our eyes. So we are not lack of pleasure. Then why do we talk about suffering? Open the eyes, pleasure is there. <laughs> and uh, ears in the world, agreeable and pleasurable, and craving arises there. And similarly, nose, tongue, body, and the mind. Each pleasurable and agreeable, and therefore craving arises there. Where there is cra pleasure, therefore there is craving. I don't think anybody dispute that. Hmm? Yeah, loka here means. The second loka. Yeah. Is also 18 elements. 18 elements. Because anything in the world outside are uh, in these 18 elements. Yeah. agreeable and pleasurable in the world. When, they, when you, you put the word, the word in the world at the end, it uh, can confuse. In the world here means uh, in this body and 
its objects with the consciousness. That is the world. There is nothing that is precluded from our visible, from our sight. Whatever you see, anything in the world outside is the object of our eyes. Any sound we hear is the object of our ears. Smell, taste, touch, and the thought. So when you, when Buddha used the, the, these six internal bases and external bases, that itself is enough to make the world. But he added consciousness also. So when we put all these 18 elements together, whole world is complete. In some places, uh, in Sanyutta Nikaya, Buddha mentioned uh, six senses are the world. Now we have more than that, three times more than that. So we don't have to worry about leaving out anything. <laughs> With the, we have more than what we want. Similarly, visual objects, uh, now you see the way how visual objects are listed here, sound, smell, taste, touch and mind objects. That is the second series of elements. Then, third series of elements. I consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, body consciousness, and mind consciousness. Then we have a combination of them coming together. Eye contact, nose, ear contact, nose contact, tongue contact, body contact, and mind contact. Contact itself is a pleasurable. When you contact with eyes, contact the world with our eyes, that's a very pleasurable. So, there again, craving arises in six more places. Now craving arises in 18 places altogether. Right? Then, uh, then comes the experience, that is feelings. The moment we feel, then feeling is our experience. Now, this is very important uh, step to remember. Craving arises from eyes, I mean, senses, sensory objects, consciousness, we even don't notice it. We don't notice the craving arising uh, in the eye, visual objects, consciousness, even contact. Until we begin to feel Vedana. But Buddha's uh, insight, wisdom was so deep. He said, even the very eye that we have is enough for craving to arise. And then when all others come back, combine together, how much more craving we will have. But we begin to notice craving only when we begin to feel. Not average person knows the craving arising in the previous stages. Just eye contact, the object, visual contact, consciousness. In these stages, 
we never noticed it. Then feeling, Vedana. When feeling arises, craving arises along with the feeling. Now, uh, feeling is just like, uh, you know, when we take uh, the uh, orange. Uh, until you press it, juice doesn't come out. Similarly, only when these two meet, these three meet together, or four meet together, feeling squeezes out of that combination. Otherwise, neither the eyes, nor the consciousness, no contact, no objects have feelings. Objects are there, eyes are here, consciousness is here, contact as soon as these three contact the object, feeling arises out of that contact. So the feeling is something which was not before. There was no feeling before. But as soon as these uh, uh, three things contact, feeling is triggered. Then start the whole mass of suffering from there. We experience it. Because as soon as feeling arises, feeling arises either with the underlying tendency of greed or with the underlying tendency of hatred or underlying tendency of confusion. Either of them can uh, cause suffering whether it arises with the underlying tendency of greed, suffering arises, whether it is arises with the underlying tendency of hatred, suffering arises, or with the underlying tendency of confusion, suffering arises. Then we uh, compound it. We make a good uh, mixture it, mi mixture of it. We perceive it. Perception arises. Perception arises when uh, uh, we feel. We perceive it and say to ourselves, it is uh, pleasant. Pleasantness is uh, uh, the feeling we had. Then we recognize it. As soon as we feel, we recognize it. That recognition is called perception. Yes. You know, just to explain as a teaching device, these are listed like this. Uh, when we say uh, such and such and such and such and such and such arise together, then it is very difficult to understand. And therefore, we put them in a certain order. In reality, all happen so quickly, it is almost impossible to distinguish. Or at the same time, we cannot say literally that all happens at once. That also is not correct. Simultaneously, they don't happen simultaneously. There is a you know, sequential order, sequence. But the sequence is so fast so quick, it is no mind can uh, break them down. But there is a sequence. Uh, also, 
you know, in the dependent origination, we say there's, a, there's an order uh, when you destroy ignorance, you destroy uh, consciousness and destroy uh, sankharas and so forth. There is a series of things. Uh, but that also doesn't happen that way. Once you destroy ignorance, everything collapses. Just like uh, that, uh, you know, 9-11, when <laughs> you hit the tower, everything came down. Similarly, when you destroy ignorance, all other 11 factors of the dependent origination disappears. Much faster than this 9-11 thing. <laughs> Similarly, when you attain enlightenment, that is what happened. Ignorance disappears. It doesn't take a, a one billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second to destroy other things. At once, all happen. It is simultaneous. But here, uh, it is not simultaneous. But it appears to be simultaneous because it is so fast. So when we perceive, uh, we first have feeling, then we perceive. What happens when we perceive? We begin to think. We begin to think. Thought arises after that. That also doesn't happen all of a sudden. That has uh, some. That takes some time. We begin to think of the visual object, auditory objects, sounds, smell, taste, and so forth. Where did the sound came? And where did the sound come? What made the sound and so forth? We begin to think about the sound. The object, once we are recognized, then we begin to think about the object. So then the process slows down. When the process slows down, then again another thing happened. Tanha, craving. Craving also grows along with the, the more you think, more craving arises. Of course, the thought all has to be, uh, have the underlying tendency of uh, greed. Then we think in more uh, intently, that is called vitakka. Then finally we have deliberation in very, very great detail, pondering on. The other one is thinking. Before that we had uh, Uh, thinking, ah, sanchetana, thinking, and then craving ag again arises. That is the, the stage where craving manifests in uh, more, more, uh, in more power. So, as we go on, we build up our strength of our uh, craving. Now you can see the 60 places where craving arises. 60 moments, right? If you count each of them, you will have 60. If you count six senses, six sen sensory objects, 12, and six consciousness, 18, then six kind of contact, uh, 24, six uh, kind of uh, feelings, 30, and six kind of perceptions, 36, 
six kind of uh, thoughts, 42, six kind of cravings arising from the thought, 48, and six kind of further thought, 54, and six kind of deliberation, 60. So you can see how we are overwhelmed with craving. No escape. Open your eyes, it is right there. Hear a sound, right there. And the whole series of them. Hear a sound, ten kind of craving arises, ten places. <laughs> Open your eyes, ten places craving arises. Right? So there is no escape. We are surrounded with craving, overwhelmed with craving. And why is it that? Open your eyes, something pleasant. <laughs> Hear a sound, there is something pleasant. So the whole world is full of pleasure. Who says the world is full of suffering? <laughs> we are everywhere we have pleasure. And wherever there is pleasure, there is pain, suffering. Why is that? Eh? Craving. We crave for pleasure. And this pleasure is not permanent. That's the problem. Not the pleasure itself is suffering, but the, but the attachment to this pleasure, which is impermanent. Pleasure arises every moment, all the time, and at the same time it disappears. I mean, next moment it disappears. Or a few moments later it disappears. But before it disappears, we already try to we try to hold on to this disappearing pain, uh, disappearing pleasure. If we recognize that it arises, but it is impermanent, then we do, when, uh, then uh, the craving that arises will not try to take root. Here it, it says, establishes itself in these 60 places, there this craving arises and establishes itself. That is the problem. When craving establishes, the ground is shaky. When it establishes, it doesn't find a root to stay. And then it becomes disappointing. And to get rid of that, uh, Buddha used the same technique. Uh, there this craving is abandoned and there it ceases. We have to cease the craving where it arises. If it arises in the eye, we don't plug our eye, but we Restrain with mindful reflection. Restrain our eyes with mindful reflection. Restrain our ears with mindful reflection. Restrain uh, uh, nose, tongue, body, and mind. All these we restrain with mindful reflection so that craving. Uh, does not arise and will not take root, establish itself. And this is the reason why we meditate. <laughs> when we meditate, we just don't sit in one place and focus mind on the breathing. 
This is a very, very involved, involved meditation, vipassana meditation. And uh, attainment or liberation becomes uh, uh, possible uh, when we understand the system, when we uh, use mindfulness, mindful reflection, pay attention, restrain, while walking we attain enlightenment. You know, uh, I mentioned uh, uh, there is a discourse in Anguttara Nikaya called Pancha Vimuttayatana in the group of five. That is five bases of liberation. Vimutta ayatana. Pancha means five. Vimutta means liberation. Ayatana means basis. Five bases of liberation. They actually not like eyes, ears, nose and so forth. But five situations. Uh, one is uh, uh, teaching Dhamma. Teaching Dhamma is a situation. One monk, I, th I think you read, you may have read it in uh, Sanyutta Nikaya, probably you might have not noticed it. His name is Kemaka. He was sick. Uh, a bunch of elderly monk send uh, another monk to him, ask him questions about his sickness, about five aggregates, asking him whether he has any clinging to five aggregates. So this monk got the answer, no. He came back and reported to the elderly monks. Then they asked him to go back and ask whether he has clinging for such and such aggregate. He said no. They, this monk came back and reported to them. Third time he went. Came ago was sick and very difficult for him to get, but he said, this is nonsense, let me go. He took his walking stick and walked, went to these elderly monks. This is very silly, you see, when somebody is so sick, instead of maintaining your dignity and your, your pride and sitting in one place, even the Buddha went to that sick person. I don't know what kind of elderly monks they were. However, they sent this monk back and forth so many times. But this sick Kemaka, sick monk, said, you don't have, you are, you are troubling yourself coming. He pitied this young monk who was coming back and forth. And in spite of his sickness, he walked to these elderly monks. And he gave them a sermon on five aggregates while giving sermon on five aggregates, those monks attain enlightenment, came again attain enlightenment. This is one place where the preacher attained enlightenment while preaching the Dhamma. So that is one place in this five. So for him to attain enlightenment while preaching the Dhamma, he must have a wonderful discipline, wonderful concentration, wonderful mindfulness, and wonderful mindful reflection on everything he taught. For him to gain concentration, attain jhana, and attain enlightenment. At the end, all of them attain enlightenment. Second way of attaining enlightenment is by just listening. We can hear many, many stories of that. One story I always quote, and wonderful story, I like it very much, of Upali. When Upali was listening to uh, 
Buddha sermon, a Buddha discussion with the Buddha. Uh, Upali was very, very much delighted. When the Buddha knew that Upali's mind was ready, receptive, free from hindrances. Mind you, this is an important word to remember. When he was listening to the Dhamma, his mind liberated from hindrances. You know, you have to have uh, concentration, jhana, to free your mind from hindrances. Buddha saw his mind freeing from hindrances. Then mind was elated and then confident. Then Buddha expounded to him the teaching special to the Buddhas. What is the teaching special to the Buddhas? Suffering, its cause, its end, the path leading to its end. When he saw his mind liberated temporarily from hindrances, that is the time Buddha gave him the teaching of Four Noble Truths. Then, sitting on the same seat, listening to the Buddha's Dhamma talk, Upali, just like uh, Upali said to himself, uh, just, just as a clean cloth with all marks removed would take dye evenly, so too while the household the Upali sat there on the same seat. The spotless, immaculate vision of Dhamma arose in him. Dhamma chakkum udapadi. Dhamma I arose in him. Meaning, he attained steam entry. Then he declared all, the, all that is subject to arising is subject to passing away. Buddha just taught, gave a sermon on the Four Noble Truth. This man listening to it and came to this conclusion just like Venerable Kondanya. When Kondanya listened to the first sermon, where Buddha did not talk about Anicca Dukkha Anatta, but Anicca Dukkha Anatta is already there. So Venerable Kondanya said, all that is subject to arising is subject to passing away. The same statement Upali made. And then, how household, household Upali saw the Dhamma, Household Upali saw the Dhamma, attained the Dhamma, understood the Dhamma, fathomed the Dhamma, he crossed beyond doubt and uh, did away with perplexity, gained intrepid intrepidity and became independent of others in teachings, the teacher's dispensation. So he attained stream entry while listening to the Dhamma. This kind of statements we can see in many, many places in the Buddha's teaching. That is the second way of attaining enlightenment. Now what do you need to do that? You got to be attentive, mindful, have mindful reflection. And you have to know uh, things arising and passing away. Uh, when uh, we see these Four Noble Truths, uh, up to this time, uh, if my meditator has not attained en full enlightenment, to at least stream entry, when, it, when the meditator comes to this level, he realizes those four stages enjoying sensual pleasures, enjoyment, danger, degradation, defilements, and benefit of 
pronunciation. But when it comes to this level, he will have add, he may add uh, three more stages. That is, as soon as he sees the defilements, then there arises a disenchantment, nibbida, uh, disappointment, disenchantment, and then there arises virag, dispassion. Then he sees the blessing of renunciation and then abandon the desire, abandon the craving. So that is what happened to Upali. He was not just a man on the street. He was a man who had been, he was extremely dedicated, devoted, religious person very intelligent person, always looking, searching for truth. That is why he, he came to the Buddha from his uh, previous teachers, he came to the Buddha, looking for truth. You know, when you are thirsty, even dirty water is tasty. When you are very tired and taste very thirsty, you don't care for pure water. Even dirty water is very tasty. Just imagine when you get pure water, clean water, when you are thirsty, how much that quench your thirst. It is just like somebody is completely exhausted getting little food, little water. This man came to the Buddha, that kind of, you know, hunger, that kind of thirst, so his all eyes open, mouth open, mind open, everything open to absorb, swallow everything that the Buddha taught. <laughs> that is why he attained the stream entry. If somebody goes somewhere with half a said, you know, you know, not very much, just to pass time and so forth, the passage will never go into the mind. One has to have a very, very great enthusiasm, very great desire to learn. So, when you listen to Dhamma with that intensity, you attain enlightenment. Third way of attaining enlightenment is taking a beautiful Dhamma ser sermon just like this discourse and read it very intently, very carefully, mindfully, between lines, reading a little bit and thinking about it. Read and think, read and think, read and think. That also helps to gain enlightenment. How we do that? How it happens? When we study this, we become so delighted to see the truth coming out of it. Every word here brings up truth. And it shines in our mind. And we think about it, pay mindful attention, have mindful reflection, mind becomes calm, body becomes calm, relax, gain concentration, and Used concentration to reflect on anicca dukkha anatta, you attain enlightenment. The fourth way is chanting. <coughs> you select a particular uh, discourse and your own deep uh, uh, devotional feeling you chant. When somebody, I, I know, when you chant with the total devotion, contemplating on the meaning, understanding the meaning, you chant. Mind becomes calm, relaxed, peaceful, joyful, you gain concentration, 
and use that concentration to reflect on anicca, dukkha, anatta, you attain enlightenment, at least the stream entry. And the fifth way is the most common uh, way that is taking up a subject and meditate. Sitting on the cushion, uh, walking, uh, mindfulness and uh, so forth that we learn regularly. Then mind becomes <coughs> uh, again calm, relaxed, full of joy, happiness, gain concentration and attain enlightenment. <coughs> so, in this discourse, the reason why the Four Noble Truth is at the end is for that reason. Up to that point, we are preparing our mind. But if somebody is very, very wise, very intelligent, very uh, mature spiritually and have a lot of parami, even the first section is enough to attain enlightenment. Mindfulness of breathing itself is enough. Because even in the mindfulness of breathing itself, you can find the entire Four Noble Truth. In mindfulness of breathing, we can see Samudaya Dhamma, Vaya Dhamma. Samudaya Dhamma is arising nature, arising of what? Arising of Dukkha. And you can see Vaya Dhamma passing away. When you see rising and falling, just like Venerable Kondanya, Upali, they saw only rising and falling, impermanence. That alone was in a, is enough for somebody to attain enlightenment. If the person is not that uh, wise, then the person may attain enlightenment, gain at least the stream entry at the next section. So somebody who does not have this kind of uh, sort of a gift has to go through the entire thing and finally study, have finally uh, learn the Four Noble Truth, then follow it exactly as it is given here, then one attain at least the stream entry. Now the last part of this is the, the path leading to the cessation of suffering that we have discussed in many, many ways, in many, many places uh, as Noble Eightfold Path. That is the last and the most important aspect because all of them tied to Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, from the beginning up to the end, what we tried to do was to practice the first step of the Noble Eightfold Path, understanding. Second step of the Noble Eightfold Path, clearing our mind of Im uh, negative thoughts, uh, you know, getting rid of greed and uh, getting rid of uh, hatred and so forth. And uh, of course, then we uh, train our words to speak correctly and we make effort and gain concentration and so forth. In many ways we practice Noble Eightfold Path all alone from the beginning to the end. At the end, all of them put in perspective, in precise, unmistakable terms. That's all we have at the end. But the for Noble Eightfold Path, we can see from the very beginning, spread out entire discourse. Not only that, if we mindfully uh, study this again, you will see even the dependent origination in, the, in this discourse. So this is most complete discourse. It has dependent origination, it has Four Noble Truth, it has Noble Eightfold Path. The very essence of Buddha's teaching is in this discourse. That is why this discourse is so important. <coughs> I think, friends, uh, this may be enough uh, for 
uh, this afternoon's talk.